Hello and welcome to our podcast on motifs in literature. This is another one of those important literary terms that we wanted to teach you guys. Gives you yet another tool to place into your toolbox when you are studying literature and looking for theme. So let's go ahead and see what we're talking about. So first off, what is a motif? A motif is defined as an item that repeats multiple times throughout a text. And so that item could be an actual physical item, like a shell, a pair of glasses, a car, or that motif could be a repeated color or action, piece of dialogue, or perhaps even a character. And so like all of these literary terms, we first wanna figure out what a motif is, And then we use that to help us deduce theme because just like character change, just like the setting, just like framing or reprise or foreshadowing or irony, motifs can help reveal the theme of any particular text. And so why are motifs important? So first off, their recurrence helps advance the plot. So we may see a motif woven through various chapters, through various songs in a musical, or throughout various scenes within a film. But the motif's recurrence helps move the plot along. And then the big deal is, as we observe and track our motif, the big thing we have to look at for motifs is their change. How does the motif change from beginning to middle to end? Just like looking at a dynamic character, where does that character start? What causes them to change? How do they change? What do they learn? That helps us learn a theme. A motif's change is very similar to that. We may observe an item throughout many chapters in our novel, but we have to pay attention to what changes it undergoes by the end. So as we talk through some examples, you'll see more concrete moments of this and what we mean by how a motif changes. But for now, go with the fact that motifs are important because their change helps reveal theme. How do we find motifs? Well, first we have to look for a recurring pattern. So ideally we are reading actively. And once we start to notice that the same thing keeps being referenced over and over again, or perhaps characters keep saying the same exact words over and over again, or perhaps a color keeps being repeated over and over again. We have to start paying attention to that, start tracking it, and start writing down all the instances where we see that motif coming back. We also need to pay attention to variations of a motif. And so in the next slides, we'll talk you through an example from Harry Potter 3, The Prisoner of Azkaban, because there's a great motif throughout that that really helps move the plot along, but also helps to reveal theme. But that motif goes under significant variation But then ultimately, we have to track the motif and observe its change. How is it different at the end than it was at the beginning? So here's what we mean by a variation in a motif. In Harry Potter 3, The Prisoner of Azkaban, there's a great motif of a dog. In that film, we see multiple instances where a dog or some sort of relationship to a dog becomes very important to the plot. At the very beginning, when Dudley's aunt is visiting, she gets very upset about people who are stupid. And she says, you know what? It's the parents' fault. It's just like raising dogs. If there's something wrong with the female dog, then there's going to be something wrong with the child. And so she starts this motif of dog. At first, we're like, well, what is she talking about? What a crazy metaphor to use. But then a couple scenes later, Harry runs away from that house. He's had enough, he's leaving. And as he's sitting in the park, the clouds roll in, the weather changes, and this dark dog comes out of the bushes and seems to kind of stalk him. A few scenes later, when Harry is back at Hogwarts, he goes to divination class, and they're being asked to examine the tea leaf remnants in their class with Professor Trelawney. And as he is examining his own tea leaf scenario, when he gets to examine his, it seems like his tea leaves are in the shape of a dog, an ominous shape in the wizarding world. And then a few scenes later, when Harry is playing Quidditch, he's chasing the snitch up and up and up into the thunderously dark sky. All of a sudden, the Dementors are all around him. And as he looks into the clouds, one of the clouds seems to be shaped, again, like a dog. 
toward the end as the kids are exploring the Whomping Willow area as they're chasing after Ron's lost rat. There seems to be a dog that's right there and he grabs Ron's leg and drags him under the Whomping Willow. And then the final variation we notice is not the dog itself but we see just dog footprints. And so here the kids are inside the Shrieking Shack after they have finally found Ron, after he's been dragged through this tunnel from the Whomping Willow to the Shrieking Shack. And again, we don't see the dog, we don't see the dog's face, but we just see footprints of a dog. And so that is the example of a motif of dog, but how it is shown in great variation. It could be a word, then an image, then a hint, then a flavor of something and then perhaps just another mention of it. And then in Harry Potter, not to give anything away, but spoiler alert, the movie's been out for a while, so I'm gonna go ahead and ruin it. That dog is important, and the motif of the dog becomes exceptionally important, because Sirius Black, Harry's godfather, who has been kind of trying to keep an eye out on Harry and try to make contact with him, is an animagus. He is able to change his form from that of a human to that of a dog. If we had been paying attention to the variations of the motif throughout the text, we would be able to understand or predict, perhaps, that the dog is exceptionally important. And then as we see here in the end, the dog is important because it's not just about a dog. It's about revealing the character of Sirius Black, of connecting him to Harry Potter, that he is actually a good character out to help Harry Potter, not to kill him like we have thought previously throughout the entire movie. And so the second part of our looking at motifs is we have pledged to read actively, we have noticed that a pattern has begun, we have tracked that pattern and any variations that might be coming along, and then ultimately we have to apply our deep and critical thinking skills and ask ourselves, how does the motif change from the beginning to the end? And that change often helps reveal the theme or the lesson that we are all supposed to learn from this particular text. So as we mentioned before, many items can serve as motifs. And so while the visual images we're seeing right now do come from the movie version of The Great Gatsby, the text of The Great Gatsby has these motifs. And so that's the text that we are talking about, the book version, not necessarily the movie version. But in The Great Gatsby, we have the item of the billboard with Dr. T.J. Eckelberg's eyeglass advertisement as a recurring motif. And so every time the characters go through the Valley of the Ashes from the West or East Egg into New York City, they have to go past this very decrepit, burned out area of ashes. But they also have to pass underneath this old billboard that the optometrist T.J. Eckelberg has left in that area. And according to the book, it is a large pair of eyes with spectacles on them. And so pretty much every time the characters go to or from New York City, the narration mentions that the watchful eyes of T.J. Eckelberg see what is going on in the characters' cars as they go past this billboard. And so if we're tracking the motif, we see it early on in the novel. We see it about a third of the way. We see it about halfway through. We see it about 75% of the way through. And then toward the end of the novel, when we have the very revealing and climactic moment, we see the narrator direct our attention once again to the eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg, who seem to observe and notice and watch over the horrendous event that happens at the climax. So if we're paying attention to the motif of eyes throughout The Great Gatsby, we can see when they happen, we can notice the context of those, and ultimately, we can pay attention to how those eyes are somehow different at that climactic moment than they were throughout the previous chapters. And as we see those eyes change meaning, that is what we are supposed to deduce theme from. The lesson we can all walk away with from the change in this motif. Another example of an item as a motif might come from the book Lord of the Flies. And we could actually look at two different items in this text. We could look at Piggy's glasses. The amount of times that those are mentioned is tremendous. But the one we wanted to talk about today was the idea of the shell or the conch. Our first exposure to this shell that calls the group together is when Ralph and Piggy find it in the lagoon early on in the novel. It serves as a tool to help keep the kids' tribe together. Whoever has the conch is allowed to speak, and if you don't have it, you may not speak. 
And at the beginning of the story, all of the boys are very respectful of that. They take turns. They hand it to each other. But as the book goes on and things start to change, eventually respect in the conch falls apart. No longer are kids taking turns. No longer are kids sharing it in order to be the one who is allowed to speak. And then ultimately, our last look at the shell is when Ralph and Piggy and Sam and Eric are going up to Castle Rock to confront the other tribe of kids as they have broken off from the main tribe. And as we read the novel, we see what happens to that shell. The shell itself as a motif has gone from a very positive image to whatever happens to it at the climactic moment. We don't want to offer that spoiler. But as readers, we need to pay attention, track, and then ultimately ask ourselves, how has the conch's meaning changed by the end? And that change in the motif helps reveal theme. We can also look at color as a motif. And again, for this one, we'll go back to The Great Gatsby. And we could debate this, whether the color of green is truly a color motif or if it's more of an object motif, because we know the idea of the green light at the end of Daisy's dock is what Gatsby continues to look at and to pine away for. But the idea is here we have a recurrence of another motif. And in this case, it is a color. The color green throughout the entire novel plays an exceptionally important role, not only in the light at the end of Daisy's Dock, but other objects are labeled as green. And so we should pay attention to that pattern and then see how it changes throughout the novel. In One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest by Ken Kesey, we have an action as a motif. In this novel, in a mental hospital, the characters do not smile or laugh throughout most of the book. Even when something funny happens, characters are not able, it seems, to smile or laugh. But as McMurphy grows as a character and influences the other patients more and more, we see the change in the motif. A place that started off so oppressive and so challenging that no one was able to smile or laugh, slowly characters begin to smirk. They begin to chuckle, they begin to laugh a little bit more. And then finally, by a certain point in the novel, we see narration that characters are guffawing. They're falling all over themselves with laughter. They're smiling incessantly. And so as readers, we need to pay attention to that action that repeats itself as a motif. An example of dialogue coming as a motif comes from the Broadway musical Hamilton. And so while we are talking about motifs in literature, and some people might question whether Broadway musicals are literature, we're going to go ahead and say they are because they are exceptionally complex. And they may not be in the canon of literature, but they are literature nonetheless. And so two examples from Hamilton. We have the line, history has its eye on you. And so throughout the two and a half hour musical, we hear over and over again, different characters saying these words, different characters saying them to other characters. Sometimes it's reversed who's saying it to whom. But the point is, here we have a repeated line that is said in various ways throughout the entire text. Therefore, it serves as a piece of dialogue serving as a motif. Additionally, we also have the line of my shot or I'm not throwing away my shot that comes out over and over again in this text. Again, various characters say it. It is said in various contexts. It has various meanings. And so it serves as a piece of dialogue with great variations that ends up being a motif throughout the entire text. And again, as we're paying attention to it, if we're tracking it, we can then pay attention to the change in that dialogue to help us deduce the theme or the lesson of that text. And then one final example of an item that could serve as a motif is the idea of a character as a motif. And in the classic To Kill a Mockingbird, it seems to us that Bob Yule serves as a motif. He is a static, unchanging character by definition according to our other podcasts. But one could look at him also serving as a motif because he does reoccur through the plot. He does help move the plot along. We do see him weave in and out of various parts of the story. And so if we are paying attention to him as a motif, we should write down and pay attention every time we see that character. What's the context as to why he's there? What is he doing? How do other characters respond to him? And then ultimately, we have to look at the change not so much in the character in this case, because we know Bob Ewell is a static character and he doesn't change, but we have to look at the change of context of Bob Ewell. 
where does he start in this text? Where does he reoccur? And ultimately, how is the context of his occurrence different by the end? That change, if we observe that properly, will help us learn the lesson that To Kill a Mockingbird is trying to teach us. And so that's it in terms of motifs. As always, the three big things we look at with any of these podcasts. Number one, what is a motif? It's a reoccurring pattern that happens in film and literature and any other text. Usually we have to see a reoccurrence of three or more times for it to kind of quote unquote count, but there could definitely be variation within a motif. Second thing, why do motifs matter? One, they help advance the plot. They help keep that plot woven together. But then as always with any of these literary terms, they help reveal theme. And then number three, how do we find motifs and how do we apply them to the search for theme? Well, we have to observe that a repetition is happening. We have to track that and probably write that down. And then in this case, we need to look and see how does the motif change? How is it different at the end than it was at the beginning? And so if we can put all three of those steps together, we'll be a little bit more able to use motifs to help us figure out themes. That's it. Thanks so much. As always, if you have any questions, please bring those in the class. Otherwise, thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon.